Last week in my lesson, I mentioned that Sandy and I and our kids have been able to attend several Atlanta Braves baseball games over the past several years. And of course, we've watched surely hundreds of games on TV. Some games are pretty one-sided and not all that dramatic. Some are what you might call nail biters because it's close all the way to the end. By the way, if you go to a Braves game and they're losing when you get to the middle of the ninth inning, they'll put up on the big screen a dramatic presentation showing all the times when they were losing and made a big comeback at the end. And of course, the catchphrase was always, we've done it before, we can do it again. Well, that's true, but most of the time they didn't. But I remember one particular game we went to, and it was indeed one of those nail biters. In fact, we were well behind at the bottom of the ninth. So of course, we're hopeful, but nervous. But that was one of the times they did come back and win the game. I mentioned this in a lesson last year sometime. Every time we'd go to a game, I would also record it on the DVR so I could watch it when I got back home, see those great plays once again, see if we got on TV. So when we got home that night, I watched the game again, except now it wasn't a nail biter at all. I got my bowl of ice cream and sat down in my recliner. I was very relaxed. And when we got to the bottom of the ninth inning and the Braves were losing big time, I'm still relaxed. Why? Well, because I knew what was going to happen. I knew who would get the big hits. I knew when the other team would make an error to keep the game going, and I knew who would win in the end. I got to watch a great game without any stress, without any anxiety, because I knew everything would turn out just fine. Don't you wish life could be like that? You know, from time to time, I talk about wanting God to send me an email, letting me know what to expect. Oh, I'm fine with having faith, but I'd sure like to know what's going to happen every day. I mean, wouldn't that be great? Something's bothering you. You're feeling down. You need encouragement. You're worried about whether or not you're going to make it through whatever trial you might have that day. Dear God, I'm having problems. What should I do? And then you go check your email and there it is. Well, guess what? All this time I've been waiting for God to send me emails. Turns out he already did. I was just looking in the wrong place. It's all in here. Suppose you're worried about something. You ever been there or something troubling you, worried about what's going to happen? Wondering what's going to happen on the other side of whatever you're dealing with? You need to know this. God has provided you with emails every day. In fact, he knows you so well. He sent those messages long ago so they'd already be there for you just as soon as you need them the psalmist said our god is a god of deliverances he's a god of victories you want to know how it all ends up without a doubt those who are on the lord's side will be victorious and you don't have to get sweaty hands or nervous stomachs while waiting on him to meet your needs. By faith and trust, you can know the outcome of everything you're ever faced with. Oh, you may not know exact details, but you can be confident that God will do the right thing for you in every situation if you'll trust in him and let him bring about his will for your life. And in this collection we call the Bible, this collection of messages and letters, God lets you know what to expect. For instance, do you need guidance? 
Uh, are you feeling lost or confused, don't know which way to go? Talk to God about it. And look then at, at what he's already written for you and to you. Look at Psalm 119. Again, that longest chapter in all the Bible. And it's right there in the middle of the Bible. And we're reminded here. God gives us so much guidance in the writings here of his word. Look at Psalm 119, starting in verse 97. The psalmist said, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thy commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, because I have observed thy precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep thy word. I have not turned aside from thine ordinances, for thou thyself hast taught me. How sweet are thy words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. From thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We are so blessed to have all these writings here and collected for us. And we can each have our own copy, probably several copies, always there whenever we need them. Turn over a few pages to Proverbs chapter 3. There's a famous passage here, and it's worth, it's worth looking at every chance that you get. Proverbs 3, starting in verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life, and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Do you need guidance? Do you feel lost? Are you unsure which direction to go, what choices to make in your life? Look at God's word. Talk to God about these things and look here. So many wonderful blessings you will find written for you in the pages of scripture. Do you have physical needs? Some things going on and you really need some help with things like that. Be turning to the Gospel of Matthew. Again, talk to God about it. And then listen to his word. Matthew 6, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, starting in verse 25. And I imagine this is a familiar passage to you. But again, just like other great passages, it's always worth looking at again. And when you're struggling, with certain needs in your life. It's passages like this that will lift you up, that will give you comfort, that will remind you you have a heavenly father who's gonna take care of you. Jesus said, for this reason, I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for your body as to what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? And why are, why are you anxious about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so arrays the grass of the field, 
which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more do so for you, O men of little faith? Do not be anxious then, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. But your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. So seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious for tomorrow. For tomorrow will care for itself and each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't you know God's going to take care of you? Philippians 4, 19, Paul said, My God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Are you struggling with sin? Be turning to Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, again, what is probably a familiar passage as we're reminded that we have a Savior who understands all about the struggles that you and I have. The Son of God spent time here on this earth. He walked on this earth for many, many years. And Scripture tells us he was tempted in all ways, just like we are. That's what's recorded here in Hebrews 4. Start in verse 13. We're told there's no creature hidden from his sight. In other words, God knows all about you. But all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with which we have to do. But then he says, since then we have a great high priest. He's talking about Jesus who walked on this earth. We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. We all go through things here. We all struggle. We all have our weaknesses. But doesn't it help to know that Jesus saw all the same temptations that you deal with as well? And so when you struggle today, you have a Savior who understands. As God listen to your, listens to your prayers, can you imagine the Savior there sitting next to him saying, I know what he's talking about. I know what he's going through because I was there. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul wrote, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, that you may be able to endure it. Perhaps there have been times that you've thought, the temptation is so strong, it's so overwhelming, I just can't help but give in. But you know, that's not really true because of this promise right here in Scripture that God, as he watches over you and he sees you struggling, he understands you, he knows all about you, and he will make sure, as difficult as it may seem to be for you, he will make sure you're never in a situation whereby the temptation really is so strong that you can't help but give in. He won't allow that. So whatever you face in life, whatever temptations, whatever struggles you may have, talk to God about it. Look at scriptures like this to remind you the Lord understands and God has promised to be with you. And every time, because of that strength, because of that help, you can be victorious. You can overcome that temptation without giving in to sin.
still feel like you need more strength? Your Heavenly Father has much to say to you about that. As it turns out, God's people have been needing his help and strength for a very long time. So he wrote about it long, long ago. Look at Psalm 28, one of the occasions when David called out to God with his needs, needing more help, needing more strength. Psalm 28, starting verse 1, he says, To thee, O Lord, I call my rock. Do not be deaf to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to thee for help, when I lift up my hands toward thy holy sanctuary. You've been there, haven't you? Hurting so much, struggling so much, needing God so much. David called out to God. Can I remind you how blessed we are to have things like this written, these messages from God long ago, so that we can see how God responded here to David. Look at the text, continue on, starting in verse 3. David said, Do not drag me away with the wicked and with those who work iniquity, who speak peace with their neighbors, while evil is in their hearts. Requite them according to their work and according to the evil of their practices. Requite them according to the deeds of their hands. Repay them their recompense, because they do not regard the works of the Lord nor the deeds of his hands. He will tear them down and not build them up. Is God going to help? Look at verse 6 through 8. Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplication. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart exults, and with my song I shall thank him. The Lord is their strength, and he is a saving defense to his anointed. When you're feeling low, when you really need that help, look at passages like this to remind you others have cried out to God long before you. And God has been there. And God has responded. And God has given the help and strength that was needed. Go over to Psalm 118. Psalm 118 again, a psalm about calling out to God, needing help. We can identify with this, can't we? Because we've been there so many times, it seems. But in messages like this that are recorded for us, we are again reminded that God is there and he will always help. Psalm 118, starting in verse 5. From my distress, I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among all those who help me. Therefore, I shall look with satisfaction on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. It is better to trust in God than anything, isn't it? You need strength. Talk to God about it. Look on down here. Verse 14. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. You know he's going to be there. Paul said, Philippians 4.13, even with all the things that he struggled with, he said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul had learned that he needed help and strength from the Lord. Remember, he, he tried to live as he should. He tried to do good, to, to make a difference. Romans 7, though, tells us he had struggles, just like we do. 
You know, that's one of those things that I'm glad is in the Bible. To let me know, even people who strive to give their lives to God are still sometimes going to stumble, are still going to struggle. They will still need strength. When you need strength, remember passages like this. Remember that God will always be watching and he'll be there to give you the help and strength that you need. Are you worried about your salvation? Be turning over to the New Testament book of Ephesians just to remind you about how blessed we are because of what Jesus did on our behalf. You know, I think sometimes we may worry about our salvation because we are looking at ourselves and we recognize we mess up, it seems like, so often. We stumble so many times, it seems. And if indeed you're depending upon how good you are in order to be saved, then yeah, you're going to be worried about salvation. But look at God's word and the wonderful messages given to us here to remind us it's not really about how good we are. Yes, I want to be good, and I'm going to try to be all that God wants me to be, but my salvation is not about how good I am. It's about how good God is, and it's about how great that sacrifice was that was made on our behalf. We're saved by grace. Grace is God treating us way better than we deserve. Look at Ephesians 2, starting in verse 4. This is after verse 1 through 3, where Paul talked about, yes, we were once all lost in sin until we came to the Lord. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he's raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In order that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not because you've been good. Not that you've been good enough. Not that you could ever stand before God and say, look how good I have been. I have earned my place in heaven. There's no way you will ever earn your salvation. It doesn't matter what you might do. And we will do a lot, certainly in response to God's grace. Just as Paul did. He said one time when he wrote to the church at Corinth, I am what I am because of the grace of God. I'm giving my life. I'm doing all that I am. He wasn't trying to get grace. He wasn't trying to get salvation. That had already been given to him. But his response was just as it should be for us today. I'm overwhelmed with the love of God and the grace he gave me. I've got to give my life back to him. But our salvation is not because of all the good works we might do. Our salvation is all about putting our faith and trust in the Son of God who gave his life on our behalf. Look over to 1 John chapter 5. One of the reasons that John wrote this particular letter here, he mentions here, was so that we would know, so that we would be confident in our salvation. 1 John chapter 5. Look at verse 11 through 13. And the witness is this that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God 
does not have the life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. It's all about Jesus. One day you, along with all the rest of us, will stand before the Lord at judgment. Don't bother trying to tell God about all the good things that you've done because that's not the basis of your salvation. There's really going to be only one thing that matters on that day. As John wrote about here, do you have the Son? Are you in Jesus Christ? Are, are you wrapped up in him? Galatians 3.27 says, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, have been clothed with Christ, have been all wrapped up in Jesus Christ. When you stand before God, he needs to see Jesus Christ. If he just sees you, he's going to see your sins and you're lost. But if you're wrapped up in Jesus Christ, there's your salvation. Are you still struggling, still worried, still having doubts? Again, talk to God about these things. And look for answers. Look here still in 1 John 5, the next couple of verses. Right after John said, I've written this to you, all of you who believe in Jesus, in order that you can know that you have eternal life. He said, and this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. To be clear, God's never promised, I'll give you everything you ever asked for. He's never promised the answer will always be yes, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. But when you're praying and you're praying for God's will to be done, when you really are seeking to know God's will, and that's what you want for your life, then you can have great confidence that God's walking with you every day just as you're walking with him every day. And according to his will, he's going to be there with you, and he's going to keep on blessing you. Look back to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, my favorite chapter in all the Bible. And there's a great passage here at the end of this chapter. Another one I would imagine most of us have heard many times. But again, the whole point of this lesson is where do I go to find answers? Where do I go to be encouraged when I'm struggling with doubt? Where do I go? Come here to Romans 8 and be reminded of what the Bible says starting in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who shall who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for thy sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. There's a guy named Arthur Rank. He was a businessman in England long ago. 
he, he decided he was going to do all his worrying on just one day a week. He chose Wednesdays. When anything happened that gave him anxiety, would annoy his ulcer, he'd write it down and he would put it in his worry box and say, I'll, I'll, I'll worry about this on Wednesday. And he'd forget about it until Wednesday. The interesting thing was on that following Wednesday, when he opened his worry box, he found that most of the things that had disturbed him the past six days were already settled and it would have been useless to have worried about them. You see, it turns out God is sending us written messages. They're ready for us to read any time we need. Aren't you glad we have a Father who loves us so very much? Let me end with this thought. I'm pretty sure that God would like for us to respond to his emails. He sees you hurting and struggling. He's watching over you every day. And you know he'd like to hear from you, at least from time to time. When you need help, he wants you to talk to him about it. And when he helps you and brings you safely to the other side, he wants to hear from you again. Listen to this. As you got up this morning, I watched you, and I hoped you would talk to me, even if it was just a few words, asking what I thought or thanking me for something good that happened in your life. But I noticed you were too busy trying to find the right clothes to put on and where to work. I waited again. When you ran around the house getting ready, I knew there would be a few minutes for you to stop and say hello, but you were too busy. At one point, you had to wait 15 minutes with nothing to do except sit in a chair. And then I saw you spring to your feet. I thought you wanted to talk to me, but you ran to the phone and called a friend to get the latest gossip. I watched as you went to work and I waited patiently all day long. With all your activities, I guess you were just too busy to say anything to me. I noticed that before lunch you looked around, maybe you felt too embarrassed to talk to me. I guess that's why you didn't bow your head in prayer. You glanced three or four tables over and you noticed some of your friends were talking to me briefly before they ate but you didn't. That's okay. There was still more time left, and I had hoped that you would talk to me. Yet you went home, and it seems as if you had a lot of things to do. After a few of them were done, you turned on the TV. I don't know if you really like TV or not, but you spend a lot of time each day in front of it, not really thinking about anything, just watching the show. I waited patiently again as you ate your dinner. But again, you didn't talk to me. At bedtime, I guess you felt too tired. After you said goodnight to your family, you plopped into bed and fell asleep in no time. That's okay, because you may not realize that I'm always there for you. I've got patience more than you will ever know. I love you so much that I wait every day for a nod, a prayer, or even just a thought from your heart. It is hard to have a one-sided conversation. Well, you're getting up again. And once again, I will wait with nothing but love for you, hoping that perhaps today you will give me some time. One of my favorite songs is Pure in Heart, O God. 
help me to be. You know, that song's actually a prayer asking God for help. Not just to be a better person, but pure as in having a singular purpose that walking close to his will would indeed be the most important thing in your life. In other words, that walking with him and talking with him and letting his word be your guide in every aspect of your life. Are you ready to live your life like that? God so much desires to bless you abundantly. It's up to you to listen to what God's word says and to live by what it says.